Jubilee Evangelical Church family. All right? You know, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. Are you glad you're here today? You know, last night, grabe ang lakas ng ulan, no? And we were just, you know, enjoying the cool weather, no? Maybe coffee, coffee. But you know what? A lot of our members in our HAP outreach ministry are suffering from flood. And I'd like to thank Jubilee for partnering with us in this ministry, no? I know I have presented this ministry to a lot of churches, but it's, it is only Jubilee who embraced that partnership. So again, I thank you very much for partnering with us. Thank you. Why don't you turn to the person beside you and say, it is good to see you today? Come on. All right. See you again next week. Sigurado yan, next week, aabangan ko kayo, dapat nandito kayo next week. So again, my name is uh, Ding Pionso and I'm an outreach missionary. You know, uh, I grew up in a Christian family and have been exposed in the ministry at a very young age. My mom used to be our pianist, <laughs> like Ate Jack, and she used to play this old Yamaha wooden piano. And for it to produce a sound, you have to pump the pedals underneath. You know what? We're used to having pianos with uh, pedals, tama? Di ba? Usually, may dalawa, mayroong tatlo. Pero the, the pedals are used to sustain the sound. This Yamaha Jurassic old piano, for it to produce a sound, you have to pump the pedals underneath. Di ba? And since my mom, she had a polio in one of her legs, my brother and I took turns in pedaling so that the piano would work well. You know, one funny but very memorable experience, we were asked to, to sing a special number, and while singing, we had to pump the pedals at the same time. If you can imagine that, nakakahingal, kumakanta, kapos nagpipidal ka, hindi yun madali. Funny it may seem, but that's how it should go. You know, it is indeed a family joint effort to be able to serve the Lord. My father naman used to be the presider, the worship leader, just like Elder Devin. And he does, sometimes he does offertory. And I can still remember he reads to us a verse in Malachi. And even up to now, whenever we do tithes and offerings, we quote this Bible verse over and over again. And whenever we read Malachi, we speak of giving. Today, we will focus on the life of Malachi. The book of Malachi, according to the Blue Letter Bible, is the final word of God in the Old Testament period. It is God's final message before the coming of Jesus Christ. Who Malachi was, where he came from, we do not know much. Some believe that the, the name Malachi is just an assumed name, not the real name of the writer. But there's no real evidence to back that up, that belief. However, during those times, uh, there were meaning in the names the parents give to their children. It is not something that they just get from dictionary or wherever. Unlike today, no? Pag ano yung usong movie, ipapangalan natin yung anak natin. I'll call you Spider-Man, di ba? Kung ano yung uso. No? They name their names, their children, according to the meaning of their names. Do you know the meaning of your names? Alam ba natin, no? You know, my daughter, she had a good friend... Uh, who hated his name so much. And then my daughter asked, Bakit? Bakit garit na garit ka sa pangalan mo? Ano bang meaning ng pangalan mo? Sabi niya, death or kamatayan. Wow. Malakai means my messenger. He was God's messenger, the last messenger of the Old Testament period. An overview of Malachi, Malachi lived about 100 years after the Israelites had returned from their Babylonian exile. And his message was directed to the people who had been living in Jerusalem. The temple had been rebuilt, and things were not going well. When the Israelites first returned from exile, their hopes were very high. They would return and rebuild their lives, and the temple, all of the great promises of the prophet, would come true. The Messiah would come and set up God's kingdom over a unified Israel and over the nations and bring justice and peace for all. But that is not what happened. They repopulated the city and proved to be just as unfaithful to God as their ancestors, resulting in poverty and injustice. So in this book, we find out just how corrupt this new generation has become. 
According to our resource, the book is designed as a series of disputes, or in other words, arguments or disagreements. In the first three disputes, God exposes Israel's corruption, and in the final three, God confronts their corruption. The first dispute starts when God says that He still loves His covenant people despite their failures, just like what we have, you know, uh, that's our message last Sunday. It, it is about God's love for the Israelites. Israel really objects, saying, how have you shown us any love? So God reminds them of how he graciously chose the family of Jacob, their ancestor, to become the carrier of God's covenant promises instead of Esau, his brother, and the family that came from him, who eventually came to ruin. So right from the first dispute, Israel is ex exposed as suspicious, doubting God's love and faithfulness. You know, we can read in the Bible that God has been very faithful to his people, but they keep on turning their hearts against the Lord. There were a lot of times that God showed miracles upon miracles, rescuing them from annihilation from their enemies, but at the end, they will still go back to their old sinful ways. And the second dispute exposes a problem with Israel's second temple. God accuses the people of despising and defiling the temple by how they are bringing shamefully lame and blemished animals that show they do not value or honor their God. But it is not just the people. It is the priests too, or the pastors who run the temple. They not only tolerate but participate in these corrupt forms of worship. How are you pastors and leaders of Jubilee doing? Today, we're going to focus on this issue, just like what I have said earlier. Whenever we hear or talk about Malachi, we associate it with giving. Ang habang introduction. Before I continue, I'd like to make a shout out to Rev. Paul Tanwanko. No? Uh, Rev. Paul is a part of this Malachi ministry, and I am one of the recipients of this very generous ministry. So, thank you, Rev. Paul. The title of our message for today is... Failing to honor God. All right. Nag-fail na yata yung aking PowerPoint. All right, let's, let's move on. Failing to honor God. Our passage is found in Malachi chapter 1 verse 6, and we jump to chapter 2 verse 9. This is actually the second out of the six series study of the book of Malachi. But before we move on, let's pray. Father, we would like to thank you for the opportunity that we can study your word today. I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you're about to tell us. Bless your servant as I speak your word. May every word that will be coming out of my heart, from my lips, Lord, will be words that would glorify you and strengthen your people. I, I rebuke any critical spirits and any technical difficulties in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. <laughs> there are three points I want us to ponder upon today. Number one, failing to honor God is a sin. Very simple. Failing to honor God is a sin. My friends, let, let's not take this lightly by saying, oh, tao lang ako, I'm only a human being. No? Anything that displeases God is a sin. Why do we honor God? First, we must understand the nature of anyone before we honor or trust him. Honor means giving high respect. To a student, being in the honor roll is probably one of the best experiences they want to accomplish in their academic journey. Am I right? It is a huge thing for every student to see their names on that list. Have you experienced being in the top 10 of your class? Sino mga honor students dito? Pakitaas kamay. Isa. Dalawa? Wala. Oh. You know, or baka naman you are one of the Pasaway students who cuts classes and would rather attend classes in the guidance counselor's office. Hindi naman. All right. You know, I myself have experienced being in the honor roll list at least once in my high school years. I was the top 10 among 11 students. <laughs> Just kidding. And you know what? I can still remember the feeling of being highly respected by my classmates and by my teachers. So why do we honor God? We can read stories in the Bible and see that God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping, and covenant-fulfilling God. 
You know a covenant in the Bible, it is the conditional promises made to humanity by God as revealed in the Scripture. The agreement between God and the ancient Israelites in which God promised to protect them if they kept His law and were faithful to Him. You know, in our times today, when you are in covenant with somebody, you agree to do and not to do something specified. There is, there is an expectation or expectations between you and the other person. Sabi nga, it takes two to limbo. Tango. No. You cannot be in covenant with yourself. It cannot be called covenant if you just expect something and don't reciprocate. That's why a covenant is called a conditional promise. Do we have singles in the house? Okay, mahiya, pakitaas kamay. Singles. Walang single? Wow. Galing, ah. Oh, sige. Would you allow, uh, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, would you allow yourself to be in covenant with somebody who cannot be faithful to you? Maybe some of you are, are praying, Lord, this guy has been, you know, uh, courting me the last two weeks. And now, nag-attend sa Jubilee. Lord, siya na ba yung God's will for me? I'm telling you, please be very careful, pray hard, ask for wisdom and guidance, especially in your relationships. And for the married people, kaway-kaway naman dyan, mga married people, yes, yon. Okay pala, no? Wala masyadong single dito, no? Do you still remember your wedding vows? Ayan na, no? Your covenant to each other? Di ba ano yung covenant nyo? For richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, through thin and thick, so help me God, no? You will love and support each other whatever it takes. You know, a covenant is very important. We have also discussed this last week. No? It is an agreement between two or more people. To a businessman, it is a contract. Everything has to be in black and white. To a gadget, it is the warranty card. Whatever happens to the item, it can be replaced at a given period of time. Three days before our car warranty expired uh, December last year, I was able to get a claim. I went to the, to the shop. Sabi ko may problema yung headlight ko. You know what? They replace my headlight three days before the expiry. Ah. Pero sabi ko, sir, baka naman pwedeng isama mo na yung kaliwa. Kasi baka naman, you know, sabay-sabayin mo na. And you know, this is really God's favor. They replaced both headlights. I was able to save at least 80,000 pesos for, for that. That's God's favor. Napakahalaga ng covenant. Sa Tagalog, ito ay kasunduan. Since the Israelite is in covenant with the Lord, worship is supposed to be a celebration fellowship with the living God. It is a time set aside for the members of the covenant, the believers, to demonstrate their faith with genuine praise and thanksgiving. And God arranged the worship of Israel in a way that praise and thanksgiving would be most natural for the people. He arranged three great harvest festivals. Number one, barley in the spring, wheat in the summer, and summer fruits in the fall. Because the harvest was a gift from God, the people were by duty bound to bring tokens of thanksgiving to offer to God at the feast of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. That's how they do offertory during those times. What if we do that today? If you can imagine, no? may mga prutas dito, may mga saging dito sa kabila. <laughs> when the Israelites came up to Jerusalem top worship, they were to bring animals from their flocks, wheat and fruit from their fields, and whatever other gifts of gratitude they wanted to give to God. We can clearly say that worship here is giving food to the Lord. Although God did not need them, you know, God doesn't need food to survive, just like what Psalm 50, 10 to 12 says, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on the thousand hills, I know all the birds of the hills, and all that moves in the field is mine. And in verse 12, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. So everything belongs to the Lord, and he needs nothing. In their covenant, Israel was to bring the offerings to God, not because God needed them, but as an expression of Israelites' need of God. They knew that without Him, they cannot survive. Because to refuse to offer gifts to God was to say that God was not necessary to their successes, and we all know that God was with them in all their journey. 
the people came to worship, God did not require a great deal of them in a way of offerings. But what they brought had to pass two very important th tests or things. They had to be the first and the best. It had to be the firstborn animal or the first fruit of the crops. God gets his share first because he is the most important and it had to be the best firstborn or first fruit offering. To bring God an inferior gift would say that not one did not think much of God. Listen to this. For the quality of the gift indicates the value the giver places on the one receiving the gifts. How much effort or money do you spend when buying a very special person a gift? Or we would say, mayaman naman siya. Kompleto na yan sa gamit. Hindi niya na kailangan ng gift. Again, God did not need anything, but rather it is the expression of worship of the Israelites need. But unfortunately, the people are always falling short of pure worship. And so the prophets came on the scene in Israel to rebuke and correct the people. In the earlier periods, the prophet had to deal with idolatry and pagan corruptions. These were the issues before the exile. But after the exile, worship was being corrupted by the indifferences and the selfishness of the people. So naging selfish na yung mga tao after the exile. And so Malachi had to address a whole different set of problems in the nation. His message is directed at the priest, but certainly speaking to the worship of the people by making a mockery out of worship by bringing inferior gifts or inferior offerings. And God was not pleased with that kind of worship. Those who offer God worthless gifts despise the name of the Lord. We read a while ago in Malachi 1.6. A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty. It is you priests who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? So Malachi charged them of despising the name of the Lord. Malachi rebukes the people. He declares, a son honors his father and a servant his master. They would respond, yes, this is what the law said. And this is how things ought to be. The word honors indicates that the son would give his father and a servant, his master, the proper weight of authority. Remember, honoring is giving high respect. But this time, it is also giving heavy respect. Malachi's accusation is clear. They were not honoring nor fearing the Lord. And so they did not really consider him their father or their master. They do not honor the Lord and do not fear Him, and yet they are priests and worshipers. Question, is it possible to be in church every Sunday, go through all the rituals, sing all the, the hymns, or probably attend all the church programs, access groups, and, and yet despise the Lord? Malachi's message is addressed to the priest, and because of their failures, the nation is also guilty of not honoring and fearing the Lord. They are also the ones who despise the name of the Lord. The word despise means to look down on something as if it is worthless. Despise in Tagalog is hamakin or maliitin or matahin. Have you experienced being looked down at? Na experience mo bang minatamata ka? Diba, napaka, napaka sakit na, na state yun, and sometimes it can be traumatic. The Lord says that the priests are despisers of my name. In the Old Testament, the name refers to the Lord himself, his person and his works. The priests thought they were doing everything right, saying the prayers and the blessings and making all the right sacrifices. It's like the Pharisees during, uh, Pharisees during Jesus' time. They knew the law and everything about the law, and yet they despise Jesus Christ and not practice what they preach. Since the priests thought they were doing everything right, they would respond to Malachi's accusation by saying, wherein have we despised God's name? Wala kaming problema. This is actually a very serious charge, and Malachi had to explain the charge. The Lord told Malachi that they were offering on the altar defiled food. Defile in the Bible means to make unclean or impure. Defile in Tagalog is dungisan. 
You know, I just thought of the triage or sanitation procedure we all undergo this pandemic season where we need to wipe our shoes on the floor mat, ano pa? put alcohol on our hands, and even check our temperature before we can enter any establishments. Not to mention the face mask, face sheet with all the quarantine passes, di ba? We do all these things so we don't bring viruses or any germs or bacteria and contaminate the establishment. Am I right? And if you don't comply, you cannot go inside. Remember, during those times, the altar, like this, no? was the place of sacrifice. It is a very sacred place to offer food to the Lord. And what they offered did not measure up to the standard because the food they offered was again defiled or polluted. These food sacrifices were both symbolic and practical. Symbolic because when they were burned on the altar, it was as if God consumed them and practical because some of the sacrifices were to be eaten by the priest and the people as communal meals. The charge was serious because the law, their agreement, requires them to bring sacrifices that were what? Perfect, healthy animals without any blemish at all. You know, I remember my wife whenever I drive her to the uh, wet market, uh, particularly chicken meat. You know, she looks at the, at the meat or the chicken meat only before buying it. Sabi niya, dapat daw walang malik buho. At dapat pang kayo kulay ng meat. You know, I always, uh, I always tell her, do we do mo naman yan? It's okay na yan, pero she would always insist in getting the best meat as possible. There are two very important reasons for these sacrifices. First, the sacrifice was a gift that was to be offered to God. Take note. Take note of this. The kind of gift that someone gives indicates what they think of the person they are giving it to. That is our last one. Would you give your wife plastic roses during Valentine's? Sa, baka sasahig ka matulog, no? Or if someone gave another person a gift that was old, used, worn out, and of no use anymore, it would be an insult. You know, sometimes we are guilty of that. We pre-qualify people. We think, pwede na yan sa kanya. Pwede na yan, okay na yan. So to bring a gift to God that was defiled was the real, a real insult, no matter how much the priest protested the charge. Second, theologically, the animal sacrifice was for atonement, signifying that the perfect animal will be offered in place of the, the sinner. sinner. Atonement is, in Tagalog is pagbabayad sala. Since the animal represented God's provisions for the sins of the worshiper, it had to be without blemish itself. This principle came to fulfillment in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross in the New Testament. He was the sinless Lamb of God who gave His life for the sins of this world. If Christ had been defiled as a sinner, His death would have been no better than our own deaths. The only one, only one who could redeem all of us from our sins was the only one who was sinless. You know, it reminded me of Romans 3.23, a very popular verse, especially in evangelism. It says, For all... Lahat have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'd like to stress that word, short. You know, in basketball, nabanggit kanina ni Revyam, in basketball, you may have the best shooting form like Elder Chris Beltran with jersey number 10. But if it's short or kapos, baliwala lang din yun. That sin separated us from God, and whatever we do, how much we give will not reach His glory because God is holy and we are sinners. So to bring defiled offerings was serious. They were not just bringing defiled offerings, they were defiling God. If the sanctuary were holy, if the altar was holy, if the sacrifices were to be holy, then to bring in defiled gifts would be to defile everything about worship. How exactly did they despise the altar and offer defiled things? In Malachi 1, 8, when you offer the blind for a sacrifice, is not that evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is that not evil? 
You know, the people knew they had to bring animal sacrifices to the sanctuary for their worship. An animal for sin offering or atonement, another animal for the burnt offering, and a third animal for peace offering, three animals to be offered from a family every time they came to the sanctuary could be very expensive. Tama? And so they brought the animals that were deceased, crippled, blind, and worthless animals they could not sell or use, but they could offer to God. After all, God was, on, was only going to burn them up anyway, just like my argument with my wife whenever she buys meat. That was very practical for them to do. So they thought, fulfill the ritual and get rid of the crummy or poor livestock at the same time. That's why Malachi challenges them, offer them to your governor and see if he will be pleased with you or respect you. God is more important than the governor. So why do people think they can get away with giving him inferior gifts? The people in Malachi's days are not the only one guilty of this. You know, a pastor shared when he was growing up, people used to collect things for the missionaries or disaster relief. And they often found that people had given junk things, junk or things that they could not use anymore. Sometimes we are like that too. Where is the sacrificial giving? There are times when we give to the Lord in worship, it is often what is left over our resources. The standard in worship from the beginning is that God gets the first and the best. The firstborn animal, the first fruit from the trees, and whatever is given to God has to be perfect and it has to be the best. I remember hearing a story from our pastor. He is sharing his conversation with a couple who had three children. Uh, they were talking about uh, future plans for the kids and of the kids. No? The wife said, you know, Pastor, our eldest son is very intelligent like my husband. He is pursuing engineering course. Oh. And the second one is as bright as my wife, the husband recalls. She can go to medical school like her mom. And looking at the youngest child, who is not that intelligent like them, they both agreed to let the youngest child go to Bible school and serve in the church. You know what? We must give the best we have to the Lord. Our money, our time, our talents, our service, so that in everything, He might have that supremacy. We honor God when we give Him the best in everything. We honor Him when we put Him first place in our lives, just like what Matthew 6, 33 says. Second, failing to honor God brings destruction. In Malachi 2, 9, So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people because you have not followed my ways but have shown partiality in matters of the law. Those who would worship the Lord must change their attitude or they may be cursed. Malachi 1, 12 to 14, the Lord asked through the prophet, when you bring injured, crippled, deceased animals to offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands? What an insult. This passage of Malachi is a condemnation of the Israel's priest for failing to bring proper sacrifices to God. God would prefer to see no offerings rather than a pathetic or impure ones. The actions of the priests were simply their natural outcome of their attitudes, which verse 12 makes clear, but you dishonor my name with your actions by bringing contemptible food, you are saying it's all right to defile the Lord's table. The message concludes with a curse. A curse is to invoke supernatural power to inflict harm or punishment on someone or something. In verse 14, cursed is the deceiver who has in his flock an acceptable meal and offers to God a blemished thing. The Hebrew word curse basically means removed from blessing or loss of the blessing. Actually, this will be the topic in the next sermon. And this is a warning to all of us. But if we keep the best for ourselves and offer God the least, God may take away even the best that we have. In Deuteronomy 8.18, remember, even the abilities to produce wealth, God may take that away from us. 
Deuteronomy 8.19, If you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today, you shall surely perish. God can even take our lives as he did in Acts 5 when Ananias and Sapphira lied to God about what they were giving. So God will not tolerate false worship. He will get rid of it. Or as John warns in Revelations 2 and 3, he will remove the candlestick. I'm sure we wouldn't want this to happen to any of us. Am I right? Third, and my last point, the people must seek God's favor to continue to be his people. We must seek God's favor to continue to be his people. Those who are guilty of worthless worship must seek God's favor. Malachi instructs the people what they should do. They have a choice. We have a choice. If we feel that we have violated the holy things, then all we can do is, number one, we can pray to the Lord for forgiveness. Malachi 1.9, And now entreat the face of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, he will show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. We have to pray for divine favor. The face of God usually represents his favor. The motivation is that God is gracious. The word gracious implies that we do not deserve God's favor, but rather his judgment, for grace is undeserved favor. In Daniel 9, 9 says, The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. And in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, here is my favorite. The Lord will not only forgive us if we confess our sins. In Hebrews 8, 12, he will forgive our wickedness and will remember our sins no more. That is pure grace. He will remember our sins no more. Number two, we need to prevent vain worship. Vain worship is empty, shallow, fruitless, without value or meaning kind of worship. In, in Mark 7, 7, Jesus quoted Isaiah, they worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. This is when Jesus used Isaiah's words to criticize the people of his day. Jesus was not criticizing the way they were praying or singing. He was criticizing their hearts and the way they were living. And in Isaiah 29, 13, though these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips and yet have removed their hearts far from me. Vain worship is when we worship the way we want instead of worshiping God has told us in his words. Worshiping every Sunday, memorizing all the songs and the verses and yet doing ungodly things during the week that is vain worship malachi declares if they continue to worship this way then it is better to lock the doors of the temple and keep the people out and when they continue then the fire they light on the altar will be worthless if we will not worship with love and devotion but only out of compulsion to follow a ritual our gifts will be worthless and they will be rejected. God takes no pleasure in worthless giving. Brothers and sisters, in the Lord, worship must be honest and spiritual. That's why it says in John 4, 23, we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Not only through our lips, because our lips can be very deceiving. In James 3, 10, out of the same mouth come blessings and curse at the same time. We must put our heart into it and offer to God the best that we have and the best that we can do. It's never too late to confess and repent from these things that displeases the Lord. God is gracious and will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping, and covenant-fulfilling God. He is always true to his promises. He will never change. He is the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. If we, we will just worship him truthfully by giving our first and our best, then we will see and experience the fullness of his covenant blessings to us. There are two groups of people 
one who gives out of abundance. They say it's easy to give when you have something to give. But do you give in proportion of the blessings or out of obligations? Number two, the other group, the one who gives out of poverty. Story of the widow's offering where the poor woman gave all that she had. Who are you in this group of people? Let's go back to my very early exposure in the ministry work. My mom used to tell us to do the best that we can whenever we give something to the Lord. You know, giving is not only limited to money. There are a lot of things we can give to the Lord. She puts God first place in her life at all times. I can still remember she has different envelopes for tithes and offering, for missionary support, for benevolence, and others. And since we don't earn yet, we were still young, she will give us money and put it in, inside each envelope and give it to church during Sunday. She also taught us that we ourselves can be the best offering to the Lord, just like the song, A Living Sacrifice. Our talents and abilities we can offer to the Lord. Because in the first place, He is the one who gave us everything and as our way of gratitude to Him, we serve Him. You know, the moment we received Jesus Christ, we were no longer called sinners, but rather saints or children of God. That's why when we offer to Him anything, our offerings can now reach God's glory through Jesus Christ. Hindi na siya short or kapos. And later on, as we grew older, she explains what tithing is all about. Years later, I became a professional singer and eventually became a missionary in 2014. I brought that principle with me and apply it whenever I do something, especially for the work of the Lord. My mom died Christmas Day of 2012. Hindi niya na nakita yung ministry life ko. But I thank God I was able to talk to her face to face. I had an emergency leave. I was able to come home the day before she died and brag about my accomplishments. You know, my success is a product of her examples. Her never-ending, unwavering faith and prayer to the Lord. You know, sometimes ministry work can be very frustrating. Am I right? Especially in our outreach ministry. Napakahirap. A lot of times, you have provided everything and hindi sila mag attend dahil tinatamad sila. Or they will ask for counsel. Okay, lahat na ng counsel, pwede mo ibigay, lahat na ng memory verse. Pero they will still, they will still do what they want to do. But you know what? The Lord reminded me to just serve Him. With, with my best ability, and He will make everything beautiful. The same encouragement I share to all the volunteers, to give all, all the best that they can, impartation, knowledge, rebuke, love, understanding, because you don't know if you can still come back and teach them the second time around. Huwag magtipid. Lahat ng pwedeng maituro at that given time, ituro natin sa ating mga kabataan. My friends, how is your giving and your service to the Lord? Let's not be mediocre when we give to the Lord. He deserves our best offering. Giving to the Lord is a great opportunity, and through giving, that includes our money, our talents, and abilities, we worship the Lord. A very familiar phrase we grew up that says, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without Giving. Parang tatlo lang kaming nakakaalala nun. Uh -oh. I want to rephrase that today. You can give without praise and worship, but you cannot praise and worship without giving. Praise and worship goes together. We praise the Lord for all He has done, and we worship Him through giving as our response to His goodness. My last verse for today, in Psalm 22.3, the Lord in, inhabits in the praises of His people. The word inhabits means to stay. He draws nearer to us when we praise and worship Him. God is present and glorified when we worship Him. He enjoys it and it brings peace and rest. Remember, God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping, and covenant-fulfilling God. He is faithful 
and He will fulfill His covenant to us. How about you? How is your covenant with the Lord? Do you honor God with your covenant? Again, good morning and may the Lord bless us. Can we give the God the best of our clap offerings? <laughs> Shall we all rise as we pray? Thank you, Lord, for reminding us today that you love us and that you will fulfill and honor your promises to us, your children. We humble ourselves before you and offer our lives as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. Empower us with your Holy Spirit so that we will be able to fulfill our commitment to you through our giving. Enable us to fully surrender our lives into your care. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. And now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen and amen. You may now be seated.